Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia Nikolaevna, the four daughters of Russia's last emperor and empress, continue to fascinate people around the world more than a century after their brutal killings in Yekaterinburg in 1918. Often thought of as a single unit, using a nickname they sometimes used to refer to all four of them, Otma, seen as beautiful young ladies in white dresses, or as dutiful wartime nurses, or even as naive young women who had few friends and little contact with the world outside the palace, their lives have been steeped in modern-day mythology. However, with the opening of the Russian state archives following the fall of the Soviet Union, the letters and diaries of the Grand Duchesses are now revealing interesting and fascinating details about their sadly short lives. Nicholas II and Alexandra Fedorovna's oldest child, Grand Duchess Olga Nikolaevna, was born on 3rd November 1895. While they may have hoped for a boy, they were more than thrilled to be parents and even took baby Olga with them the following year on their visit to England and France. Over the following few years, three more daughters were born, Tatiana on 29th of May 1897, Maria on 14th June 1899, and Anastasia on 5th of June 1901. Olga has been described by a close friend and confidant of the Empress, Anna Vurubova, as being the most like her mother in her nature. She had light-coloured hair and was known for being straightforward and honest. Growing up, she was stubborn, independent and forthright. She was somewhat hot-tempered and sensitive. Olga was musical, playing piano excellently by ear and having a confident, if thin, singing voice. She loved poetry and reading and possessed a deep and serious religiosity. In her files at the Russian State Archives are many notebooks filled with where she has copied out favourite poems and religious quotes. Nicholas and Alexandra's second daughter, Tatiana, had a gentle nature. She was somewhat shy and reserved, but conversely was also the Grand Duchess who enjoyed outside company the most. Tatiana was tall, slim and elegant. She had dark hair and grey eyes. She was very close to her parents and tried hard to always be obedient to their wishes. Tatiana was very skilled at needlework and had good taste and a sense for fashion. She strived to be helpful to others and was a born nurse. Her siblings called her the governess as she looked out for them, ensuring that they were doing all that their parents and teachers had instructed. Her cousin Irina affectionately called her Tanichka. To her younger sister, she was Tanka. Maria had a very easy-going, kind and friendly nature. She was very beautiful, with thick golden-brown hair and large, luminous blue eyes, known in the family as Marie's sources. She had inherited her grandfather Alexander III's strong build, and as a teenager was able to lift up her English tutor, Mr Gibbs. She loved little children dearly. Maria was stoic and possessed a great deal of inner strength and energy, which stood her in good stead during captivity. She was a great support to her mother during the days of uncertainty of February 1917, while her other sisters were sickening with measles, and was chosen by her parents to accompany them when the family was split up in April 1918. Within the family she was often called Marie, and was affectionately named Masha, Mashka, and even Mandrifoli by her brother. The youngest Grand Duchess Anastasia had, as Anna Vurubova had described it, an extremely lively and original personality. She was always finding some form of mischief as a child and was keenly observant of people's foibles and comical features. Anastasia was a born mimic. As a child, she was sometimes described as an enfant terrible. She was always on the go. One of the guards at Yekaterinburg described her as being like Quicksilver. While she never lost her sense of humour and joie de vivre, the seriousness of the situation she and her family found themselves in had its impact, and Anastasia's later letters show a much more sober and serious side to her nature. Anastasia's childhood nicknames were Nastaska and Malinkaya, and then during the war she started calling herself Shvibzik, which was also the name of her Pomeranian dog. The meaning of the name is uncertain, 
It could be from an old, somewhat obscure Russian word shibzik, meaning a short person, or perhaps from a Germanic term for a tipsy, merry person. Empress Alexandra was a very involved mother, as her own mother had been, breastfeeding her daughters, as well as using a wet nurse, and nursing them through childhood illnesses. In 1901, Olga became ill with typhoid. The Empress wrote to Margrethe von Fabrice, Please do not expect any letters from me now, as Olga has come down with typhoid. Luckily, it is a mild form. I am with her as much as possible. She is in a single room, dozes much, drinks only a little milk. Rather bad-tempered today, as her sisters are of course strictly kept from her. Later on, Alexandra also nursed Anastasia through diphtheria. The Empress paid close attention to her daughter's education. The Grand Duchesses had a very full curriculum of study, mostly with private tutors, such as the Russian language tutor Pyotr Petrov and the French tutor Pierre Gilliard, but they also attended physics classes in a classroom at the Realnoy School. Lessons began at nine and continued until one when there was a break for lunch. After lunch there was time for walks in the park and other activities before lessons resumed at five and continued until seven or eight in the evening, though on Saturdays lessons finished at lunchtime. In 1909, the imperial family paid a visit to the Isle of Wight. Maria recounted in her English exercise book how they met Auntie May and Cousin Mary, who is the Princess of Wales, later Queen Mary, and her daughter, and had played on the seashore looking for seashells. Olga and Tatiana went into town to go shopping and bought their younger sister's bracelets. The following year, owing to her failing health, doctors ordered the Empress to undergo treatment at Bad Nauheim in Germany. The doctors were also concerned over Tatiana's heart, and she was also prescribed treatment at the baths. The imperial family stayed at Friedberg Castle, which belonged to the Empress's brother, Grand Duke Ernst Ludwig of Hesse. Every morning after breakfast, the Grand Duchesses would go for a walk with their governess, Sofia Tulcheva, especially enjoying going to shops and buying a variety of items. Anastasia, in particular, was delighted with the toy shops where all kinds of things for dolls could be bought. In the afternoons, they enjoyed excursions in motor cars to various places of interest in the surrounding countryside. After the treatments at Bad Nauheim were finished, the family moved to Wolfsgarten before returning to Russia. In 1911, the family travelled to Kiev for the unveiling of a monument to Emperor Alexander II. While there, the Emperor attended the opera with Olga and Tatiana. During the last intermission of the show, while the Emperor had left the royal box to have some tea, Prime Minister Stolypin was shot. Sofia Tjurjeva, who was also present, reported the confusion in the immediate aftermath, recalling that Olga thought perhaps one of the boxes had collapsed, and Tatiana asking why the Prime Minister was covered in blood. Olga recorded in her diary that evening how Stolypin was taken to a clinic, and the crowd at the theatre stood and sang the national anthem. Every summer before World War I, the family would spend time at Peterhof on the Gulf of Finland and go for a cruise on the imperial yacht Standard around the Finnish skerries. The Standard held a special place in the hearts of the Grand Duchesses, and they always refer to it as the Der Standard in their letters and diaries. On their cruises, they would stop off at various islands and skerries, where there would be picnics, games, swimming in the sea, and walks.
when younger, Alexandra Fyodorovna would join in on the walks and activities. But as her health deteriorated, she more and more often stayed on board ship while her daughters took turns to stay with her. Olga writing to her grandmother about how sad it was that her mother was unable to join in with them. On board the ship, the Grand Duchesses would go roller skating and play card games, dice games and puzzles in the evening. There was also the cinematograph which they all looked forward to. All four Grand Duchesses loved summer and lying around in the sun. Olga wrote to her Russian tutor Pyotr Petrov in 1913, It was 34 degrees in the sun. Well, isn't the weather tempting? We are all very tanned, which I am very happy about, and we are all healthy. This fondness for an outdoors life, lying in the sun and getting tanned caused some controversy on the 1914 summer visit to Constanza, Romania, where the Grand Duchess's tanned skin was unfavourably commented upon by ladies at the Romanian court. The Grand Duchesses enjoyed a great rapport with the officers on board. In 1911, Tatiana wrote to her grandmother about Olga's name day on board ship. In the morning, the officers gave me a packet and asked me to give it to Olga, so I did. And what do you think was in it? A frame made out of card and a portrait of David they got out of the newspaper. Olga laughed a lot and for a long time about it. The picture was of the heir to the British throne, who was at the time speculated to be a future match for one of the older Grand Duchesses by the press. After the summer cruise, the family would return to Luvadia in the Crimea, where they also spent time in spring around Easter, when the Grand Duchesses would assist their parents in handing out eggs and Easter bread or kulich to people. Grand Duchess Olga said that in Petersburg they worked, but in Luvadia they lived, and this was certainly the case. There were excursions, visits to friends and relatives, shopping expeditions in Yalta, whereas Olga wrote, it's fun to drive along the embankment and meet acquaintances, and dances. In the mornings, the Grand Duchesses would go swimming in the sea with the Tsar, and in the afternoons there were tennis matches. In September 1913, Grand Duchess Tatiana wrote to her grandmother, we go swimming in the sea every morning, which is dreadfully fun, especially when there are waves. I know how to swim now, so it's awfully enjoyable. After lunch, we usually play tennis, and there is a little house and garden there where we have tea. Levadia was also the place where the Grand Duchesses took part in the White Flower Day, a charity for tuberculosis patients, and also in the bazaars where they would diligently make a range of things for sale. Order now your copy of the Romanov Royal Martyrs, What Silence Could Not Conceal, which is an impressive 512-page book, featuring nearly 200 black and white photographs, and a 56-page photo insert, of more than 80 high-quality colorized images, appearing here in print for the first time.